Hello class and welcome to Lecture Notes on Ancient India. Like other early civilizations, geography will play a key role in where people settle in ancient India. India is a subcontinent, meaning that it's divided from a larger continent, in this case Asia. The Indian subcontinent is divided from Asia by the Himalaya Mountains, which are some of the tallest mountains in the world. The Indian subcontinent includes the modern-day countries of India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. The Himalaya are located to the north of the subcontinent, and they are the home to the world's largest mountain, Mount Everest. The Indian subcontinent has two fertile river valleys, the Ganges and the Indus. The Ganges flows toward the Bay of Bengal in the east, and the Indus flows to the Indian Ocean in the west. Another important feature in Indian geography is the monsoons, which are seasonal winds that blow either from the north in the winter with cold, dry air, or from the south in the summer with warm, wet air and rains. These rains are very important in cultivating crops in India. One of the earliest civilizations in India was located around the Indus River. The civilization flourished from around 2500 to 1700 BCE. Much like Mesopotamia and Egypt, the civilization grew along a river, the Indus River. The river provided transportation, it provided water for crops, and it was an important resource for early Indian civilization. There were two large cities in this area. One was Mohenjo-Daro, which was one of the largest Bronze Age cities in the world. Uh, the other city is Harappa, which is similar to Mohenjo-Daro. Both of these cities were very planned out, and it showed that despite the fact that they were around 400 miles apart, the early Indus civilization was very organized. These cities were built on a grid pattern, just like modern cities. They had paved roads, they had drainage ditches and systems, and they had two-story houses with bathrooms in them. Like other early civilizations, the Indus Valley civilization had an economy that was based on farming. Uh, this is very similar to Mesopotamia and Egypt. In the Indus Valley, they grew wheat and barley, and then they taxed those crops and stored them, just like we saw in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. They're also known for having domesticated chickens to use as a food source. Cotton textiles also provided a good source of wealth. Uh, they were able to weave cotton into cloth and sell it in trade with other civilizations. Uh, they traded as far away as Mesopotamia, so all the way over between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers with the Assyrians. The Indus Valley also had a writing system, however that writing system has not been deciphered yet. Like other civilizations of the time, copper and bronze were used for tools and weapons. And the Indus Valley civilization was prosperous, well organized, and had a pretty good trade network with its neighbors. Somewhere around 1900 BCE, the Indus Valley civilization started to decline. This was around the same time that a group of migrants began arriving from the Iranian plateau, and they were known as the Aryans. Now, it's not sure if these Aryans came and integrated themselves into society, gradually becoming the dominant culture, or whether or not they invaded and conquered. The Aryans brought with them a new form of language, it was an early form of Sanskrit, which is part of the Indo-European language family. The Indo-European language family includes languages such as Persian, English, German, Italian, and Greek. When the Aryans arrived, they also came with their own religion. And the verses and hymns that they used for their religious practices were known as the Veda. It is one of the earliest literature forms in Indo-European languages. Uh, some of the writings of the Vedas include the Mahabharata, which is an ancient religious epic, the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the best-known sections of the Mahabharata, and the Ramayana, which is a 25,000-verse poem. The Vedas and the Brahman holy writings would later be the basis for Hinduism. The Vedas discuss a society that's divided up into social classes. These social classes are known as the Varnas. The four classes are the Brahmins, which includes the priests, the Kshatriyas, which are the nobility, the Vaishyas, which are commoners, and finally the Sudras, which are non-Aryan workers or manual laborers. 
These classes are commonly known and referred to as castes, which is based on a Portuguese word when the Portuguese arrived in India. Within each varnas, there is a subdivision into multiple other layers known as jati. At the very bottom is a class known as the untouchables. This caste was responsible for completing jobs that were considered unclean, such as street sweepers and undertakers. These classes dictate many aspects of social life and can influence everything from careers to the location that you would stand or participate in a religious ceremony. Ancient Indian society revolved around three main pillars, the village, the caste, and the family. The family was central to ancient Indian life. It was based on a patriarchal system where the oldest man was in charge of the family and seniority brought status. Authority was passed on from father to eldest son. Men in ancient India held more rights than women. Only sons could inherit. Only sons could go to school, and only sons could become priests. Women were subordinate to their fathers and their husbands. Emphasis was also placed on the interests of the family, not the individual. Society was also focused this way, and society looked for stability, respect for elders, and a family and group solidarity. The first main empire of ancient India was the Mauryan Empire. India had been invaded by Alexander the Great of Greece, and when he invaded, he destroyed the small kingdoms that were in place prior to that. However, after Alexander the Great's death, Indians united to throw off Greek rule. One of these was Chandragupta Maurya. He was a soldier who seized control of the capital of Padalaputra in the Ganges Valley. After that, Maurya began to consolidate his control, and he established the Mauryan dynasty, which lasted from 326 to 184 BCE. Maurya created an efficient empire that spread all the ways from the Ganges Valley to beyond the Indus River. He divided his empire into provinces, and these provinces had postal systems to help aid in communication, they had courts that had uniform enforcement of the laws, they had tax and law enforcement officials, and they had a huge army to protect the empire. During the Mauryan Empire, trade flourished, and agriculture was the main economic activity. Probably the most well-known Mauryan king was Ashoka. Ashoka was the grandson of Chandragupta Maurya, and he ruled from 273 BCE to 232 BCE. During that time, Ashoka expanded the empire through conquest. However, in one of his last battles, the Battle of Kalinga in 262 BCE, he became horrified by the brutality of war. After that, he converted to Buddhism, and he adopted non-violent laws into his empire. He had his edicts, or laws, carved into rocks and stone pillars that were placed around the empire. Some of them still survive to this day. He continued the efficiency of the empire that had previously been in place, and he became more well-known as a peaceful ruler than as a military expansionist. However, following his death, the rulers that came after were less kind and taxed heavily, which split the empire, leading to its decline. Ashoka's religion, Buddhism, was very important to the way that he ruled. As leader, he built thousands of stupas, which are Buddhist temples, and many of them are still around today. He sent missionaries out, which spread Buddhism from a local religion into a world religion. However, he was also tolerant of other beliefs, and although he favored Buddhism, his official policy was that others could practice their religions. He also worked to try and create a better society for his people by building hospitals and roads and creating rest stops along these roads for travelers to use. He also passed laws that encouraged good deeds, nonviolence, and respect. After the decline of the Mauryan Empire, it would be 500 years before another empire emerged. That empire was the Gupta Empire, which rose around 320 CE and was started by Chandra Gupta I. It's important to note this is a different Chandra Gupta than the one that began the Mauryan Empire. Uh, Chandra Gupta I and his grandson Chandra Gupta II would expand their empire to the north. Though it wasn't as large as the Mauryan Empire, it did control a very vast region of the northern Indian subcontinent. 
The empire was set up very similar to the Mauryan Empire, with provinces that reported to the rulers of the Gupta Empire. Like Ashoka, they also were tolerant of other religions. However, the Gupta Empire was interested in Hinduism, and they built many Hindu temples within their empire. The empire also had a very extensive trade network that stretched all the way to Rome, and Rome became a very important economic partner, which brought vast wealth to the Gupta Empire. These ancient Indian societies produced rich and distinctive arts and culture. They made advances in mathematics, science, and medicine. Music was very important to these cultures. Many of the epics and poems were sung. Religious scriptures were written, but also dramas and books on wisdom. As I've mentioned, many leaders produced stunning stupas, temples, and palaces. They also made advances in mathematics and science. In fact, the Gupta scientist Aryabhata discussed quadratic equations and the Earth's rotation and spherical shape, as well as the solstices and the equinoxes. Mathematicians created a sign to represent zero and were able to explain the idea of infinity, while physicians learned to sterilize wounds, set bones, and develop drugs to help treat illnesses that were used well into the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. Thank you for joining me for lecture notes on a brief history of ancient India.